You are listening to the Red Roots Podcast. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. The joy good morning. of the Lord is my strength. Amen. No amen from Simon. He's not. No. Um, well, <laughs> it's been a uh, it's been a big week. Uh, some surprises this week, no? Yep. We had, as we mentioned last week, uh, if you listen, if you didn't, I'll tell you again right now. Anyways, um, we had our elections on Sunday, which was two days ago. Uh, yeah, two days ago, right? Yes, we had our our, our presidential elections in Bolivia on Sunday. Um, without getting too far into it, last year we had a president who was going for his fourth term, even though the term limits are two terms, and um, it was just turned into a dictatorship, guys. Like, it doesn't matter what um, the news outlets or whatever, that's literally what was happening. And so people, you know, um, he was, it, it, there was a referendum to see if he could run again. He lost the referendum. This was in 2016 because he was preparing to run for the fourth term. He lost the referendum, but then somehow slipped behind the cracks and went to Supreme Court and got it, which was all his Supreme Court, of course, and got himself approved to run again, even though the people voted no. Um, and so he put himself in the election. He was, um, he was, the election was really close. And here you got to win by 10 points or you get 50, or you have to get 50% or win by 10 points. Those are the only ways you can win. So if you have 49% and the other guy has 40%, you don't win. It goes to a second round with the two top candidates. And so um, it was pr- it was really close. And then magically, the computers froze for like a day or something like that. I don't remember how it was. It was, it was some hours. Let's at least say that. Um, and then when they popped back up, magically, he was winning by just 11 points. And so anyways, there was a big investigation and um, found a bunch of st- stuff. And anyway, he, he was cheating. He, it, he was trying to rig the election. Found all these ballot boxes stuffed full of people that only voted for him 100%. <laughs> like, you think you would be smart enough to be like, hey, let's throw a few. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it doesn't look whatever. But they, and they were sneaking these ballot boxes into the counting place. And it was just an absolute mess. Um, and so then he tried to declare victory. Then they tried to go to a second round. And like, he was trying to just force his way into another presidency uh, dictatorship at this point. And um, the people of Bolivia, uh, just went out and blockaded, marched, and whatever, and basically just shut down. That's the best way to put it. It wasn't even about necessarily blockading. It was just shutting down. Shut down the economy completely for 21 days or something like that. Um, like, we just weren't working, like nothing. No no movement, no nothing. And, you know, I, I will be honest, that was probably the most unified I've seen Bolivians since. Yeah. Not Obviously not every single person because he still has supporters and stuff, but, like, even on that side of it, it was a lot of unity. When we can unify over hate, boy, like if we hate something enough, well, it brings us together. Hate brings us together more than love, which is a weird thing. Mm-hmm. But anyways, um, so anyways, that happened, and it it forced him into uh, quitting. Like he just did, he didn't have an option, so he stepped down. And then they started saying it was a coup, and they just it, again, it's just a uh, soap opera with this guy. That that's what um like I feel like I don't have a social media home because I get on Twitter and I hear people from all over the world saying it was a coup and that Bolivia has continued their fight and won their democracy. So according to the world, we are living our democracy dream right now. Well, okay, like, well, you didn't get to that part of the story yet, but uh, that's what we're getting to the update. But like (laughs) people say, the people have been saying like from that people have never been to Bolivia in their entire lives and couldn't can't point to it on the map. Can't name two cities in Bolivia. And they're like, they know everything that went on here. And so they're saying that um, democracy has been restored. How was democracy restored? Through an election. How did that election happen if democracy was dead? Because of what they're, So this is what they're saying. They're saying democracy was restored because they're accusing uh, the Christians and the Christian right and blah, blah, blah of staging a coup to kick him out and took over the government. That's what, that's what major news outlets... They're mostly liberal news out- outlets, but that's mm-hmm. what they're saying. And that the U.S. had a part in it. Yeah, which is none of that's true at all. Um, the U.S. probably wished they would have had a part, but they, they, the way it was set up, they couldn't even, if they wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, Bolivia was not friendly with the U.S., so there's not a lot of U.S. influence 
uh, at all with that stuff. Now there is more with the new. What, anyways, so what happened is, is um, so there be, he, st- he he ran off to Mexico, whatever, um, uh, political exile or what is it called? Uh, political asylum. refugee asylum. Yeah. And so he took a lot of his party people with him. Party people. <laughs> his members is whatever cabinet, whatever. The problem with that is, is when he quit, no one was able, none of his people were able to step into and take over, you know, as the succession or whatever, line of succession, because the vice president went as well. And so the person that stepped up was like a lady who was uh, part of the opposition. And she was the next in line because it was like, there's a show with Kiefer Sutherland. I can't remember what it's called, but it's like this thing where everybody blows up Mm -hmm. and they, some, some terrorist blows everybody up. And this guy's like, uh, the something of housing or whatever. And because everybody died, like he's the next in line. And it's kind of, that, that's more extreme than this, but like, it's kind of like that. Everybody left. So she was next in line. So she stepped in and, um, you know, they accused her of taking over and it was a coup and it was all stage so she can be in power. Well, she, uh, planned elections. So first thing, if you want to take over power, that's doesn't seem like the first thing you want to do is stage mm-hmm. elections. I mean, How dumb can you be? I want to be in power, but let's do elections first to make sure that I have a chance to lose this power that I staged the coup to get. Like, you know what I mean? We're already not making sense here, guys. But then she she put her name in the in the she wanted to be the next president, which okay. But then it came to the end and she withdrew. She withdrew her name because she thought it was important to defeat his party. So wait a minute. You staged the coup to take over and sit in power, but then you withdraw your name from the election. That was like, that doesn't make sense already. Yeah. And then, like, you know, and she, she is, right wing and left wing are different here than it would be in the United States or even the UK. Like, it's just, it's not, this, everybody's pretty much left here. There's left, 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 left center and, and right left, like, or middle or whatever, you know. And um, so she's the furthest right left that you, <laughs> that you get here. Well, not the furthest. But anyways, she stepped down to say port. Su- say port. She stepped down to support a guy who is a leftist. I mean, he's an absolute leftist. He's a leftist in every definition of it. So it wasn't even about, but that's what all the news articles leave out. I don't know if you noticed that. Mm. They all talk about like the people, the coup from the right and the right wing this, but they leave out the fact that these people, a lot of them, most of them actually, except for like two, which are clowns, um, but they stepped down to support this leftist person, not because they support their policies, but because they see how dangerous the other option was or whatever. And so, but they leave that part out and they, it's right wing Christians, blah, blah, blah. And U S it's like just conspiracy theory central. And, um, that's not what happened. Anyways, the elections happened on Sunday and it was a democratic election. It was a fair election. Um, that's a victory for Bolivia, I think, yeah. mm-hmm. but the party, uh, the party of the ousted president won of his successor or whatever they won, which is not um, probably the best news for, for Bolivia altogether. There's a lot of other stuff there we're not going to get into it today because it's not a political podcast, but it's important that you know, because uh, we talked about all this last year and stuff. And so it's important, I think, that the listener kind of know what's going on and kind of be updated about that. So there's talk of, and he's pushing to come back already, the ouster president, he wants to come back and... Um, He's kind of been a puppet master and all this. So there's, there's some deep concern there. This is the same party who tried to make it illegal two years ago to invite people to church and pick people up for church. Um, and now the narrative is that right wing Christians are the ones that ousted them. So now that they're back in power, what do you think is going to be their approach? I don't I mean, God, we pray that they give their life to Christ and whatever. But. I'm not sure that that's going to, you know what I mean? I'm, mm-hmm. It can happen, but that, just on paper, that doesn't look like that's the path. So there's some major implications there, right? And so there's a lot of things that could possibly happen or uh, I don't know. Well, I mean, we can't speculate too much because then it just turns into a waste of time. Um, we do know our calling hasn't changed. Uh, we've kind of had this conversation yesterday a little bit with you. And then also obviously I've been having it with you because I live with you. And um, yeah, and we talk. So um, our, you know, our, our calling hasn't changed. Our, the, the goal hasn't changed. Nothing has changed as far as who God is and what God has said and what he sent us to do. Um, circumstances around us have changed, but our circumstances haven't changed because our, our circumstances don't really change. And so um, yeah, that's kind of where we are on this whole deal. There's going to be a lot of we have a guy who wants to come down next year. 
So when the interim president took over, she eliminated the visa needs for Americans. And she wanted a better relationship with the United States, whatever. You can have an opinion on that, whatever. That's a different thing. Um, but now I imagine a lot of those rules and stuff will change again. And I imagine that it, it doesn't, it looks like a tough future, a tough political future ahead because I don't see them being losing power in five years. Mm. Like, I, I mean, I imagine for the next 20, 25 years, they're going to be in power. That's just me not being negative. I just, I mean, that's what the trend looks like. And, um, and two, when there was an opportunity for people to show themselves like, okay, a different way, they, all they ended up doing was fighting. And they fought each other and battled each other. And it was like, okay, I think a lot of people were just like, uh, we, at least we knew where we were with, you know, when we were with the movement to socialism, like we knew yeah. where we were and stuff. So, so, yeah, big deal. It was a tough day yesterday, a lot of hard conversations. Not hard conversations, just listening to people's hearts and stuff like that from around here because people here tend to be on the same page politically um, and just kind of hearing people's hearts and their struggles and frustrations and fears and concerns and whatever. And um, so, that, that you know, that was a little bit tough. Um, but equally, just having the hope of Jesus, you know what I mean, like that we do have and having that in your pocket to always be able to offer as a valid and eternal solution is like, yeah. I don't see, like, other than that, you're just talking. You know, you're just, you know, you're just talking in circles or whatever. So that's where we are, right? <laughs> or no, I guess. Yeah, I think, like, sometimes, like, it's a little bit hard for me to fully grasp the severity of uh, or the possible consequences of, of the party being in power because, like, to me, moving is just a plane right away you know it's like like even in the states if i didn't like what was going on in the states i didn't like my lifestyle in the states i would just i would just move and here like or at least consider that you have that freedom you know to do it but for a lot of people they're rea- they, can, they can't ex- escape their reality so they they know that for generations and generations the decisions made today are going to affect their their families and and their future yeah which now gets into an immigration conversation right and that i mean not for you but for people who like legit should possibly or need to there's a there's a point i hope not and i pray not but there is a point to where a lot of younger bolivians at least are going to start needing to consider going to another country Mm -hmm. by the pattern and the history of this party that's the truth now i hope that's different because he's a different person. So I think it's unfair. Mm. Uh, is it? But anyways, uh, it partially unfair to say, just equate him to what's happened for the past 15 years. Um, but until so then it's like, okay, well, where do they go? You know what I mean? Because it is true. People do just want opportunity, man. A mm. lot of people at this point, when it gets to this thing, they just want to be able to make make a living and, you know what I mean? Just have a decent life and they can live in peace and whatever. And mm. I think as Americans, just like you said, we don't, get that and i know you guys have some immigration like arguments and conversations as well but i think because we've been sitting in a state of prosperity for so long our thing is like dude just get a job like you know what i mean it's yeah. like and it's not that simple on the other side of it and people are like clamoring to come and I understand there has to be policies and control and stuff like that i'm not even saying one way or the other i'm just saying it's not as simple as we make it yeah. it's not as simple as everybody come in but nor is it simple as everybody stay out or mm. like, or just do it the legal way. Why don't you yeah. just do the ten year process when your kids are seven? Mm. Well, I mean, it defeats the purpose. Mm-hmm. Eighteen, by the time I, you know what I mean. And so, not okaying illegal immigration, but I'm just saying it's a complex issue. That's all yeah, I'm yeah. saying. It, it's a big decision. Like people make it like it's a simple decision, even if your country is not in the best condition right now to pick up, leave all your things and go to another place where you don't speak the language and illegally go in where you know you can be caught and yeah. separated from you. Like, that's not an easy decision that people are making to pick up. That is a huge decision made through tears and, you know, through stuff for some, through prayer. Mm-hmm. And, like, don't I'm not going to say what God is telling them because I don't know. But, it's, it, my, again, my point is it's not simple at all. It is not a simple black and white issue. Yeah. Um, I think we are we are fortunate um, to be able to say, I want to go live in Ireland. Mm-hmm. They're going to give us passports mm-hmm. without an issue. Well, we just have well, to prove that. Visas. W- I mean, visas, my bad. Uh, we just have to prove that we make some mm-hmm. kind of, have some kind of income coming in, you know. Um, Bolivians can meet all of those 
those requirements and still get denied a visa uh, to enter into the United States. I don't know mm -hmm. how it works in the UK. Um, and so you do find a lot of illegal situations where people are in Spain illegally or people are in the United States or different countries illegally because you didn't have the money to apply for, to do it the, the correct legal way or, or they tried to do it the legal way and were denied over and over again. And so um, it's, it's, it's disheartening, one, that you, to even think that somebody doesn't want to be in their country, you know. Mm. They can't, just can't see a future in their country, a place that you were born and you love, you know. But then, um, two, to know that I can't be in another country either. So where, where, where am I? You know, you know, I can't, I can't imagine that. Yeah, breaks my heart. Yeah, it's tough. <clears throat> but it's just you know, shows the complexity of all these things, and they're not e e easily solved by like, yeah, this, that. It's not, yeah. it's not a hasty, hasty decisions don't aren't helpful, and extreme decisions, right, left, up, down, are yeah. not helpful, and they're not real solutions, honestly. And to, and to, and I think. The nerve of us to think that we know the, the solution like oh well they should just do this yeah. like you have no clue <laughs> yeah i think that's not something i struggle with in a sense but um when you come from privileged backgrounds and you've, you you mm -hmm. come from a country where a system works in favor for you mm -hmm. so and and then you go somewhere where the system doesn't work in favor for you and then you're kind of thinking oh you know it'd be great if if people here you know would start their own business because i could go to the uk right now and start my own business but if I yeah. wanted to, if I had yeah, an yeah. idea, I could go there right now. Within 48 hours, I could own a business and I could start it up however I wanted to. Whereas it's like here, my auntie in Santa Cruz, um, she wanted to open up her business. But the amount of like red tape she had to go through, yeah, the no, amount she had to pay. To do legal. Yeah, like she would have been in debt within like the first two weeks just mm -hmm. to try and start up a business. Um, and so she was like trying to find other methods like, okay, well, could I do it this way? Could I do it that way? And it's just, yeah, it just wasn't worth it in the end. So she's not going to open the business because yeah. it isn't worth it yeah. for her. Like the amount of money that she'll have to, to give up to, to even start it. And then the amount of debt she'll be in the amount, yeah, just the amount of work that comes with it. It's like, it's not worth it. I just keep doing yeah. what I'm doing. Um, and so, yeah, it's like you were saying, you're like, you, you feel like you have the solutions to people's problems, but actually mm -hmm. you don't, if you don't understand the system that, that's working yeah. where you are it's so much harder well here because of the bureaucracy and all like like and just the ridiculousness of oversight of oversight of oversight so much mm. so that it gets lost in like you get punished for trying to do things the right way mm. you're totally punished for it and that's her situation that's i mean that's yeah. what's happening with her it's like she's trying to do the things the right way because you don't so many people open their businesses illegally and they don't care yeah like some people are just just the way they want to do it but other people it's just too it's too much like and they can't and you got to live today like i can't go spend five days waiting in line over here mm. then go to the bank to deposit because you can't be trusted at this business. The government doesn't trust their own employees to handle money. So I got to go to their other employees at the bank that the government runs, which like, you know what I mean? It's just silly. Well, why don't you hire some of those people and yeah. some over there so I can pay them. And it's just, mm. instead of dealing with corruption and stuff like yeah. that, it's just, we yeah. try to circumvent it, but then it creates this extra steps. Mm. And then like you have to pay all these different penalties and that because people aren't paying taxes yeah. So they tax you even more, and like you, and you literally get punished for being for doing things the legal way. Mm -hmm. Literally, yeah. So and then everything like, has to go through like this center in La Paz yeah, as yeah. well, and so it's yeah. like people that don't even know your situation now get the final say on everything mm -hmm. that you do, and all it takes is for them to hit the red stamp saying denied. Yeah, you know, that's it. Because they don't care. Like, yeah. and like, and, and you're exactly right. And that's another problem too is everything is so centralized. Like we can go to a government office here. And all the, I mean, they're the the boss of this and the, you know, they have all these titles and whatever, but all they, all they can do at the end of the day is send it to the centralized government office where everything is controlled there. And so mm -hmm. like, it's, it's problematic. And like, so they don't have any, they're just here to receive our papers and tell us what we need essentially. Mm. And I'm not insulting those people, but that's the reality of the system. Yeah. And so like you said, you have to send it off somewhere else. And so, uh, I just think we, I mean, I didn't get it before I live here, so I'm not being over yeah. the critical of Americans yeah, yeah. or whatever, but like, it's just something you don't understand until you live in. Yeah. And it's like, oh, and even for us, like, it's a small taste because we still do like manage our money, our nonprofit is in the US, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so our major stuff, so we've had a very small taste of it compared to other people. We're not trying to run a business or anything like, you know what I mean? Not yet, at least. Like, we're not doing any of that stuff right yet. And it's, I mean, it's going to be terrible when we do. Best thing to do is hire a lawyer. But unfortunately, the lady who wants to open a legal empanada stand obviously doesn't have the money to hire a lawyer. You know what I mean? So it's just like you, you just can't win, you know, no. and it's not. And I think people don't get that about 
people's passion for America. Like, people aren't passionate about America. Like, it's not about, like, they're not, they just want an opportunity, man. That's it. That's it. They, you know, and they're willing to put up with all the stuff, you know, going to Walmart and people yelling at you, we speak English here. But, you know, they're mm-hmm. willing to deal with all that because they just want to provide for their family. And I know, is it 100% of people do that? No, but the vast majority, that's what, they, that's what they're there for. And so, um, and then, you know, the church's place in that is pretty obvious, but we've somehow allowed politics to um, infiltrate the way that we view uh, the, the, um, the pilgrim or the stranger or the traveler or the, the what's it called, the immigrant. You know, we've, we've allowed uh, politics to tell us how we treat them. Now, we should allow the government to, to uh, enforce their laws that they have. I mean, we, don't, we can't stop that. But equally, that doesn't, we, sh- we can't allow them to overstep and tell us how we should love people, or how we shouldn't love people, and put a standard on that. But that's what's happened, right? It's like, I mean, that's what's happened in the U.S. anyways. It's like, at least in the U.S., is politics is just oh, it's hijacking Christianity. But that's another subject for another day. Maybe. But <laughs> anyways, so <laughs> before we... Start a political podcast, which we've already done. Uh, but it, I, you know, honestly, it is necessary to talk about that, just for perspective and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and people can kind of understand both sides of of this stuff. That's not easy. Um, I think, like, as as Christians, you know, because we're like, well, we don't want to cause any kind of division or chaos, so we're going to stay far away from politics. Don't mention it. That's how I was raised. You don't mention politics in friendships if you want to remain friends, <laughs> in relationships if you want to remain. Your vote was always anonymous because you didn't want to co- create any conflict with anybody in your family. And so as Christians, I think before we were told to completely stay out of politics, it's not, it's not a field for believers because politicians are deceptive or whatever. Um, and then on the other extreme, it's like, oh, yeah, law and order. God wants order. God wants law. And then... Now, suddenly, you see this, I don't know if it's suddenly or just that we see it more, this wave of Christians that are like just all about politics because politics is sacred and it's very Christian. Yeah. And um, I think just in the history of the world, as, as humans, as believers, we've always found it difficult to find that middle ground. So we're supposed to love. Well, because it's lonely. And that's the real issue of it is we have a natural tendency or natural um, desire to belong. To something, and then equally, we who wants to lose? Like no one wants to lose. Yeah. So we, you combine our natural desire for belonging, and then equally our desire to want to win, and we team up with who we think has the best chance because we've been convinced and and deceived into thinking that we lose. Like winning is more important than obedience and being committed to the gospel. And this is what we talked about. It's the same issue with with, with the football uh, league or whatever the church football league. There's the, the rule is that people, the people have to go to your church, like, like be members, essentially. They can't like, well, they came one time in 1940. No, like they have to be members. And so and then equally, the elders have to sign off saying that these people are members. And so, of course, other churches have added people, they're not even like believers or anything, like just out there playing or whatever. And so but that our church is not we don't do that because what's more important for us to win a church league football game? Or our integrity. I guess it's, I mean, for me, it, it's that simple. Mm. It's absolutely that simple. We're not bending rules and stuff to, in the name of winning because essentially we're losing. Mm. That's what, you know what I mean? And b- because we have no eternal foresight or, or whatever it's called, I think that's the right word, <laughs> we focus on winning here and now. And so because we don't understand, we don't grasp eternity, what Jesus has for us, we don't understand. It's, t- it's gone from... Uh, self-sacrificing religion to a self-preserving religion Mm -hmm. and so anything that we can do to preserve ourselves and me and me feeling good and winning and and so then when we really obey what jesus said we find ourselves isolated and so we're isolated and like i'm not a part of that and you have you do you have this longing to belong to this or to that and you can be a part of political a part of a political party i'm not saying that can't be possible but equally you don't belong there yeah so i can go to you know, I can go to Australia tomorrow, vacation, whatever, but I know I don't belong there. Mm-hmm. Not because I'm American or black, it's because I know I belong in Bolivia right now. And so it's like, you, we can go and be a part, we can collaborate on stuff, but you, we, we cannot belong to these parties. Mm-hmm. We can't belong to them. They should belong to us, but that, again, mm-hmm. another thing. We see that a lot, too, and in, in not just politically, in in the circles of, like, what 
what Christian circle or sector you belong mm-hmm. to. Am I evangelical? Am I Baptist? Am I, you know, um, I don't know, Calvinist? Am I, you know, Reformed? All of this other other stuff. And then, and then I too find myself in that little floating area where it's like I don't belong to any of these <laughs> these people. Yeah. But it gets lonely is because you, you know everybody's always pulling this, and this is oh, and you you just don't feel like you're a part of anything. But you are a part of everything that's important. And that's where Jesus fell, though, is you had the religious, like, extremists and whatever. But then you had, you know, other people like, like we, we, they tell the story of Jesus's encounter with sinners because he's always, it's he, but he's almost always going to them. And so it's a positive encounter. But then you see, like, there are people that mock Jesus for his faith and stuff. Like, it's not like that was, a, but that was the normal. That was the norm. And that's why it's so impactful that he does have these special encounters with people. Um when he's like when they're like he's forgiven their sins and they're repenting and following him all the disciples but they were jewish so it's a different kind of dynamic there but like just different things with gentiles and stuff like that you know but he didn't belong to any group and that was really the problem is everybody wanted to lay claim to jesus and he's like nah like i ain't you know and so they come over with caesar give to caesar and the pharisees wanted to be your teacher but you're eating with these people and then these people you know like he's not going to be hijacked by anybody he's not on your team he's not on your team and he's not on your team he's on his own team you know and I think for us, like, we tend to struggle with or feel like that that's just not enough for us sometimes, but it is enough. And so, which I, I get the struggle, but the reality is that that is enough. Jesus, we say that, we sing it, Jesus is enough, and, but then we get up and, like, we've joined this thing and we've sacrificed, like, half of our faith, at least, <laughs> or at least the very points of faith on either party. And then we, we dive all into this and we sacrifice parts of our faith for it. Mm-hmm. But anything that causes you to sacrifice any parts of your faith, even things that you would consider minor, is uh, a distraction from the enemy. Again, doesn't mean you can't collaborate, but being a part of this thing. And so it's just dangerous. It's a dangerous place to be. And it's, mm-hmm. that's where we've gotten caught up in as a church. And I mean, here in Bolivia, that's, an issue, that's the issue, too, is that's what's happened. It's, it's a newer, that's a newer idea here. But that's what happened in this, this election as well, is... People wanted to vote for a Christian candidate, and he was not even a Christian. And like, yeah, it's just a—it was a whole mess, a whole mess. And like, but we're just so confused and so lost, and we have this need for a home. And Jesus is like, and Peter writes, like, you're just pilgrims passing through. Yeah. This is not your home. <laughs> like, they we're literally told this in our Bible, and like, but we just we don't we have this we we can't resist almost. It seems like. And, but that's why it's important to what we always talk about now with Simon at least is the importance of heaven. It's like understanding, like what is what is that? What does it look like? And what is the expectation? And because we'd have we have no expectation of that, so it's hard to live in the reality of a place that you don't know anything about. And it's not because the Bible doesn't indicate anything; it's just because it's not taught. And so it's like, okay, so of course the you know reality is we're going to live and just see what we see and off of you, whatever. Anyways, it's a deep mess. Deep mess. Mm. Don't drag me back into that, Melinda. I was, I was sure enough was, but let's move on. <laughs> yeah, let's move on. All right, so the topic, the second topic for today <laughs> is uh, our biggest challenge in missions. So what has been, till up until now, what has been or what is your biggest challenge in missions? Um, on your different levels, personal level, ministry level. Um, what I guess what is... What has been your biggest challenge in um, keeping you from reaching your maximum potential to date? Right. We, we believe that your potential always changes. My potential today, my capacity today is lower than it will be tomorrow and so on and so forth. So you can always be growing because if you're growing, then your potential changes. Right. And so my potential is that if it's at a seven today, it has, it's going to be at an eight tomorrow and nine. So I'm always growing. But for today, what is holding you back? Uh, what is your biggest struggle? What has been hold, what has hold, held you back from reaching your full potential? <clears throat> I mean, you guys did we, know this question did, before. We did. Yeah. You told me last night, to be fair, right when I was La- about to fall asleep. <laughs> I was probably already asleep. And then you woke me up. So you remember? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you've just thrown that potential. Okay. You've thrown that potential bit in last minute there. <laughs> no, uh, okay, we'll cut that off if you want. But it's the same thing. It just—it's the same exact same thing. It's just I'm specifying it for the listener. Mm. Okay, I—I'm I, just messing <laughs> with you because I did did get a few minutes to think about it today, and I think I don't know. I think there's a lot of difficult. There's a lot of challenges I face um, as a missionary, but. 
I think f one of the biggest ones is finding the balance between who am I? I don't deserve this missionary title. I don't even know how to do this correctly versus I'm a superhero about to do all great things for Jesus. <laughs> and it's like, um, and I, I, I tend to lean more towards the side of who am I? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Um, because I think looking at all Christians, I feel like we all do this. We are all called to do missions in our everyday lives, right? And so, so knowing that, oh, it's almost like a little bit of a guilt. Like everyone else has to be working their full-time job then go home and take care of their family full-time and then, and then in those spaces be a missionary, you know, whereas I um, get to do this and create, it's still in my spaces, you know. I am a full time mom. I am. I do work, and um, and in those spaces, I I also am a missionary. But but when you look at it, I am a full time missionary. You know, people are supporting us to be live here, be here, and do ministry here. And so, I'm, my challenge is like, am I doing enough? And then and then when I ask myself, am I doing enough? I'm like. Well, who am I to even do this? Like, I am mean most days. I am I'm tired. I am. <laughs> Why are you looking at Simon? I just his Simon doesn't know my mean side. I, I didn't say anything. I just was seeing <laughs> well, his maybe you do. So I don't know. You can, don't talk on it. <laughs> um, I am talk just. Like <laughs> I, I just don't, in my mind, fit the the mold of what a good Christian missionary is, especially after picking up the book uh, Beyond the Gates of Splendor and, and reading about the saints and all of those missionaries. The saints are their last name. That's not... Oh, yeah, my bad. Oh, no, I mean, uh, it's not your bad that their name is... I know, I should have said, yeah. you know, the missionaries that went to Ecuador risked everything, mm -hmm. um, including their lives, you know. Um, like, I don't even... That, that is real missions, you know. What I'm doing is like, what am I doing? And so <laughs> I think that's my challenge. It's like, I'm a missionary just having to define constantly what it is that God has called missionaries to be and and then challenging myself also to be that every day. Yeah, that makes sense. So do you feel like that over the years you've made progress in, in that though of like getting, you know what I mean? I mean, because this is something from day one. This is a day one yeah. up until now. Oh, no. In the beginning, I, I fully thought I deserved this role. <laughs> so when did it? Who, I sacrificed everything to come here. I am a missionary, oh. and I was proud to say so, it. And I was. So when did it start then? I think it started like the more. When you got here? <laughs> like no, after I, you got here? After. On the plane, you had it all together. <laughs> like a week in, you're like, man. Like, oh, no, oh, it started no. when I, I think. I started to work on my pride. Like, you're not all that. Get off of that pedestal that that you allow people to place you on or you put placed yourself on because well, of the title. Was this a long time ago? Or it was, was a while it, ago, yeah. It like, wasn't recently. Like five years ago, ten yeah, years ago? Yeah, yeah, maybe like when the girls were born. Okay, I like think that nine years ago. I think, oh, okay, that is a good, good point. Um, I think having the girls and being home with them full time was like, well, darn now i'm not doing anything for the lord you know and so i had just to, raising these just kids, raising just these full, children full time gotta, discipleship like jesus said for the change lord disciples and clean and all things i hate doing and, and so i had to um learn to find god in my daily life and it wasn't just like an event um okay i'm going to plan this reading time with these little orphans at the orphanage and call it the work of the Lord and call it missions. Like it wasn't a specific m moment scheduled in my planner that said, I'm going to be a missionary right now and do mission things. It was like, I just have to be this every day, all day. So you feel like you, I mean, you felt like, I guess, and this is a part of your thing is like, you feel like you need to do enough to be qualified, yes. like to be like validated. I think is the word. Yeah. It's like, so do you have a, <laughs> But do you have a number or like, you know what I mean? Like, is there a space that you could possibly get to to where you would feel validated? No. Right. And so which is the healthy side of it? I, I mean, you know, definitely. So, yeah. So you but you feel like you've gotten better. Yeah. Yeah. I've gotten better in, in knowing that I'm in. Uh, it's interesting because my challenge is like, who am I is also my comfort knowing who am I? I don't yeah, yeah. have the power to save the world. And I'm not required to, you know, we have somebody that did that already for us. And mm -hmm. so 
um, just rest in knowing that. But but still, the challenge is still like, am I still doing enough? I still get it every single day. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Um, how do you feel that the, the, like, the process of prog- like the progression that you've uh, experienced in this area, do you feel like it's changed the way that you do missions? Like, so uh, let me clarify the question. I'm not good at asking questions, as you can see. <laughs> I mean, I'm good at asking questions. I'm not good at asking them clearly. I mean, I understood what you I know, said. but I just want to make sure the person listening understands okay. as well. It's like, um, let, me make, let me say this the right way. Oh, so, like, the progress in, as far as, like, uh, feeling adequate or inadequate, the, pro, the, the process of, like, growing in adequacy, adequacy, I may edit up, but you know what I mean, in Christ... Do you feel like that process has um, changed the way that you do missions and you view missions? Um, yeah, I think I touched on it a little bit in just that, in that it's not always going to be just an event that you do at a certain time of the day. Like it mm-hmm. happens when your friend shows up at your door and says, my brother died and yeah. I want to go grab a drink right now, you know, or... What kind of drink are you talking about? Like an alcoholic drink and get oh. drunk, you know. And I haven't done that for years, but it's the only thing I want to do right now. Or, um, you know, instead of saying, I mean, you know, those are those are opportunities where where God can, or where we can in, introduce people to trust in an almighty sovereign God, you know, and give you hope and, and not just say, oh, don't drink because it's going to ruin all your sobriety. Like that is not the solution. So, so. I mean, being ready in those times, I think, is what. So that's helped you. That that's the way that it's. So before you weren't ready in those times. No, before I was. Can you text me so you can I can prepare a scripture verse to give you in this moment because I've got nothing for you. You know. Yeah. So for, <laughs> before I'm, it would have thrown me all the way off. Like I don't know what to say, and I suck at this. Yeah. Well, I'm just trying to connect the dots. So like, before you felt inadequate and now you found, found you, now you feel more adequate I in think, Christ and that has caused you to be prepared for when people show up at your door no I'm still never prepared but to be like more willing to I guess <laughs> now I'm all over oh the because place. you're not depending on yourself right. anymore you're, right okay I'm just okay uh, no I just wanted to just you know that it's in in the moments of our lives that Christ can be glorified um versus before I felt ready, but I wasn't always ready because those things were in a controlled environment. Missions mm-hmm. was a controlled environment yeah, it for was me. Out there. Yeah. And um now it is not controlled. I can't control when it happens, where it happens. It's just life. Yeah, yeah. Right. That makes sense. So basically just learning to rest and depend on him without like not lazy and that we don't study anything. We just say whatever. But equally like not be so concerned about this is a mo- my moment to qualify myself or whatever. This this is um Let's just be, like let's like let the Holy Spirit speak because you know yeah you can't prepare for those things or whatever right right but in in the way that I view it now I still feel like am I doing enough because it doesn't seem fair that I'm just being a Christian this isn't missions I'm just being a disciple a a, a, a Christian a, you know a child of God and this is what we're also well, called yeah. to do yeah that's so I mean that's not even just what we're called to do that's supposedly who we are you know yeah it's who we are right. And so, yeah, no, I get it. I get that. What about you? You've had time to think now, 24 hours. And so. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, so I, my line of thinking went more along the practical side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first one, maybe slightly more obviously, is, is language. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that has a bigger impact than you think and then you thought. So like, yeah, I think you're always aware like, okay, if I'm coming out here and I don't really speak the language, it's going to be tough. Yeah. I mean, you get here and it is tough and you get that. But I think it's only really when you start progressing a lot more and you look back and you see how things changed as you were able to speak the language that you realized how much of a barrier it was. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like for me, like on a working level, uh, on the football ministry thing, the first year was really tough. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have much of a relationship with the guy that I worked with. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't much communication at all. Um, it was it was really really difficult at times because um, you're turning up to something and you just have no idea what's going on um, you don't find things out until the last minute or, or whatever um, and you put that down to oh you know maybe he just doesn't like me you know have I done something wrong or whatever whatever um, but as time's gone on I look back now and I think a lot of it was just that because I didn't speak the language mm-hmm. and I think 
And this isn't pointing fingers because I'd probably be the same if the ro- if the roles were reversed and I was working with someone in England and they didn't speak English. I don't know how much patience and how much time I would have constantly to be like, okay, I need to be because you've got, you've got to go out of your way for that person twenty four seven to make sure that they're understanding everything yeah. um, and whatnot. But um, definitely now, as my language has improved, I have a great relationship with yeah. this guy. Like it, now, he like texts me all the time. I know exactly what I'm doing. He trusts me completely. Sending um, you memes and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and so I look back and I think a, a lot of that was just the language. Like as the more I learned the language, the mm. more that I grew in confidence in the language, the more he started to trust me. Yeah. The more he was like, okay, so yeah, Simon can do this. Simon can do that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you look back and you think, okay, that was, that was a real barrier. Yeah. where I didn't really know it because you're living in it and you're working and mm-hmm. you know some people are great and they just they'll be of you no matter what whether you get the words completely wrong or don't understand anything they'll still be there uh, whereas for other people it takes you know they won't open up straight yeah. away if you don't speak the language you know they're not just going to yeah. suddenly commit themselves fully to you yeah um, and so it's, it's a process it's a, a building process for them so I got a question about yep. that I know you got more but I just got a question about the language part real quick mm. so how hard do you see language at on a scale of one to ten language learning oh, obviously one is not hard mm. ten is extremely hard I guess you can answer this as well um, probably an eight or a nine. Yeah, I really, really struggle how, with. How it. difficult is language learning? Yeah, or oh, yeah. Oh, it's it's uh, it's frustrating. It's hard it, because even though most people would listen to me speak and say, "Oh, you speak well," you know, your Spanish is good. I still every single day find myself flustered and frustrated because mm. I can't communicate yeah. what I want to say. To but you. and yeah, so how? So okay, then I'll ask this. How much of that do you feel is mental versus it's really hard? Like, you know what I mean? Is it is like, or how much of it is confidence based? You know what I mean? Like, mm. it's got to be a lot of confidence because our children, you know, yeah, they exactly, don't even man. know their timetables and they're like, my kids, like, <laughs> Jolie, no, is not, Jolie's it, English but. is not great. Mm-hmm. She, well, I'm going to get more bigger next year. Now, what more bigger? <laughs> be, because she's at this somehow. She's crossed over backwards because their first language is English. And she translates her thoughts from Spanish to English now. And this is the kid who didn't want to speak Spanish. Why do they keep spe- talking like that? Remember she said yeah. that? Yeah, <laughs> why are they talking? Like, so it's Spanish not too. difficult because, you know, children do it every day all over the world. They're learning mm-hmm. several languages at one time. I think it is a mental thing and a confidence thing. Mm-hmm. What about you? Yeah, definitely. It's, um, it's that sense of getting flustered, getting frustrated because... Obviously, especially like you're later in your life in terms of like mid 20s or whatever you've gone 20 years of just speaking you've been able to say anything that's on your mind you've been able to communicate you've just been able to say it because you grew up like you said you grew up learning the language and so you knew it I can just speak English mm-hmm. whereas now you're in a position of I can't just say anything that's on my <laughs> mind I can't just share my <laughs> opinion yeah. I've got to really think it through <laughs> beforehand yeah. and yeah. so like there'll be times when in meetings I'm sat there and I'm thinking okay we're on the topic of uh, what color cup should we get? And so I'm thinking through in my head, <laughs> how do I say, oh, yeah, I yeah. think we should have purple cups. <laughs> yeah. By the time I've worked out in my head, <laughs> they've already they've purchased done. yellow yeah. cups. <laughs> <laughs> yellow cups have been brought. That whole conversation. Yeah, exactly. Yellow cups have been brought and we're on to topic five. <laughs> and I've just worked out in my mind, like, what's the color? What's the weather purple? What's the weather purple? <laughs> purple is high. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. But people have moved on. And so it's that frustrating thing. You're yeah, like, oh yeah. man, I'm lost again. And then because you spent so long focusing on purple, I'm now like, okay, I'm not 100% sure what topic we're on now. And so now I don't want to share. And they just quiet. <laughs> yeah. Because, and because then you beat so yourself lost. up. Yeah, yeah. Like, I couldn't even remember purple. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, you just, like, and then you just don't ever want to speak again. Yeah, yeah. You're I just a listener. Another, I think another barrier challenge, too, is that you work with the limited vocabulary that you have or the limited verb conjugations <laughs> that you know. Um, and so you try to make sure that what you want to say is going to be short and, you know, concise. You can communicate what you want to say, but also not sound like rude and super direct. And so like, we've all been accused of just being very direct. It's mm-hmm. like rude, you know, those Americans are those, ex- uh, how do you say ex- those foreigners? Like they, mm-hmm. they're just so, so rude. Just like, I'm not rude. I'm just, I just wanted <laughs> to get what? my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like super direct. I don't know how to say you don't sound good singing that song in a nice way in Spanish. Like in English, I can fluff it up. In Spanish, you get what you get. Like we're in the middle of prayer at the end of the meeting and Simon just yells, Perfect. 
purple cup. <laughs> like, what? What's wrong with this guy? Take it easy. I got it. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's it, it's a, I, that's what I would. I, that's my opinion too. It's a huge confidence issue. Mm. I mean, and when your point with kids, I'm we get back to you. But your point about when you said something about kids, um, kids don't have that. I can't, mm. and they're not as ashamed as we are. Like you yeah, change kids' true. diapers. They're throwing up all the stuff and falling. You know what I mean? Like you're always carrying them and like they don't have. They eat they their boogers in public. Yeah, so they, don't like, have, they don't have <laughs> shame. No shame. So it's like not, they don't feel that like, oh, I said it wrong. Let me not talk yeah, again. Yeah. Like they don't care. You know what I mean? Like SEO. When, uh, what's the name? <laughs> <city? laughs> yeah, it's a little. In the, I'm not going to explain that. Whole. Anyways, it was funny. Uh, I think was at the door the other day and he had a mask on, like <laughs> like a superhero mask, Captain America. And he's like, oh, who's that Captain America? And he's like. S yo, <laughs> like S yo is not even how you say it's, it's so yo, but he's a kid, so he didn't, you didn't care. And but that's I think that's the thing is we have shame, and so we like we tend to hunker down or whatever. But anyway, sorry, we completely hijacked your no, no. point, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so that's that's the first one that came to my language. Uh, the second one, I think the more missionaries I speak to, the more I think people struggle with this one is the the idea of making friends or making friends on the mission field mm-hmm. because. You know a lot of people. Like I know so many people here. I don't have that many friends. I have yeah. you guys and I have Rudy. And that would probably be all. I clarified that. I was about to shut it down. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. Click. <laughs> like that would, they would be who I consider as friends. Yeah. Um, and so you're at this weird crossroad where you know so many people and so many people know you. And then you're, you're, you're like, man, who's my, who's my friend mm-hmm. in this? Um, like who who do I go deeper with? Mm-hmm. Who do I share with? Who can I hang out with? Like in terms of I've built that relationship because this is like the first time in my life where you you almost have to leave your house in search for friends, yeah. Yeah. and it's a really weird concept <laughs> to get your mind behind because yeah. you just you go to school with friends, you go to college with friends, you go to university with friends, and then you have friends that you have your next door neighbors, people you grew up with, yeah, yeah. and so you've just had friends, and then all of a sudden you leave all them behind, and you you've gone to a place you don't. And you start meeting people. And so you know loads of people, but you're like, wait, I haven't made any friends. I just yeah. know these people and they know me. Um, and then like you hang out with people. So I'll, I'll hang out with Rudy a lot and he'll take me places. We'll go to football together. We'll go to eat together. Um, and he'll meet up with his friends and you tag along. And then you're kind of like that guy that's people like and you're there, but you feel like you're just tagging along. To everything yeah. if that makes sense you're like, rudy's friend hey yeah. rudy's friend yeah i'm i'm there because rudy's invited yeah. me yeah, yeah and yeah, it's yeah. like and it's not that they don't like me and i don't like them because if i'm not there they will ask oh where's simon where's simon and the next time i go they're like hey where were you where were you but i don't i wouldn't class them as friends yeah, because absolutely. we're not at that level of i would go yeah. to them if i have a problem and i'd share with them or they would come to me yeah. or would we hang out outside of rudy like would i go for lunch with these guys if rudy wasn't there it would be awkward. But to be fair, Rudy probably doesn't go to those people when he has problems either. They're mm. just like, yeah. oh, let's hang out and be goofy together yeah, and yeah. have fun. Well, that's right a now. challenge here, too, is that's a good topic is friendship is uh, that maybe everywhere. But we live here, so that's just what I'm talking about. Yeah. But friendship does not go deep. It is friendship is acquaintances. It's people that I've been around for a long time, but we've never yeah. gone like anything deep or whatever. I found out about some stuff because you know if you did something and the police you know hmm. or if your father dies or whatever you know what i mean which is some you know the case for some like you know obviously you know that but i think people mistake knowledge for depth yeah so like you know what i mean they know i know about this person a lot so we are really good friends and that's yeah, not necessarily yeah. true either yeah. you know yeah and, which, and we know it's not just speculation like i've actually asked rudy and i've asked different people like you've known them since you were three how deep does your relationship go and not very deep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, he'll say, very he'll, yeah he'll, he'll, he's straight up about it. Now. But what makes it harder for you, too, mm. is because you're looking for deep, meaningful relationships in the midst of a place where a lot of people don't understand deep, meaningful relationships. Mm. And, you know, we don't expect that from non-believers. But in believers, we should be the people. That's yeah. what, I mean, of deep, meaningful relationships. Because we're told to confess our sins to one another. Yeah. We're told to pray together one another. We're told that in Acts, they had everything in common. And you know, it doesn't mean they all. You like Seinfeld? Me too. Like it's not what that you know. It's not what that means. And like so, they, but we don't see that in us now. And so it's hard. It's like it's a weird concept when you want to go past that superficial barrier of, of friendship and go into deep, meaningful, like family. Like I can confess. Come, like what? What are we doing today? What are we eating today? 
where are we, you know, what are we dealing with? When I'm, you know, I'm going to your house, no knocking and like, or call, you know, whatever. And like getting to that level of, and not just, definitely enjoy, including enjoyment, but equally like just that support, you know. Just want to clarify, the British don't do that. You must knock and ask for permission and wait for them to give you permission yeah, 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 to come yeah, you in. Yeah, someone's house. He's like, yeah, <laughs> text me from across the street, yeah. <laughs> coming over. And then Simon will walk in. I'm like, I have to tell him, take a seat. I'm like, what are you Yeah, he'll just stand there. Like two years in, he's just standing there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is so crazy. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. But yeah, so that that is a tough thing though. Like yeah. finding meaningful mm. friendships because you, as well as well you just like you go into an environment and you're which is which, and this is great because you're introduced to people. So like you'll take me around and you'll introduce me to people. Rudy will take me around and he'll introduce me to people. But the only people then you meet are the people that you've been introduced mm-hmm. to. You don't like, and this is something I was talking to you a couple of weeks ago. I was like, okay, where's my, where's my sphere? Sphere? Sphere. Sphere. Mm-hmm. Or my, my, my place, mm-hmm. which I've discovered, which I've gone to, where I've met people and where I've formed friendships based on that. Like, I don't have that. If, all the friendships I have have been ones where people have introduced me mm-hmm. into it, which is great. And that's definitely needed yeah, for yeah. When, you, when you arrive. But it's like, I go, I go and I play Saturday football uh, with a team. Uh, with a bunch of guys from church and then a whole load of other guys uh, that everybody knows and kind of like hangs around with or whatnot or just people that want to play and we're a team there Uh, at first I was like oh yeah that'd be really cool I love football so that'd be the natural place where I go along Uh, two years in I'm like man that isn't that isn't my crowd like the people are nice don't get me wrong Mm -hmm. but I'm like okay this isn't this isn't my crowd this isn't my space this isn't my sphere Mm -hmm. Um, and so I go along you know and I have fun sometimes it's frustrating or whatever Um, but I'm like okay this isn't I'm not going to develop any deep friendships in that group of people. Like I said, they're nice people, uh, but age gap barriers or interests or whatever, that isn't the place where I'm going to create deep, solid friendships. So it's like, okay, that's been enjoyable, but I now need to break out of that and try and find my own space, like find yeah. something else that I'm interested in and try and meet people outside of this this bubble that I've been put in and that I've created myself or um do you get what I mean? Like that, I mean, no, that, that bubble that you've arrived yeah. in Absolutely. Um, and to try and break out of that and say, okay. Well, it's healthy. I mean, it's yeah. a healthy thing too to have. I mean, like you said, as a kid, you had neighborhood friends, mm. you had football friends, you had, you know, you had school friends or whatever. And so you have these different groups of people that you can connect with and grow with. And it's the di- diversity is really what it is, mm. is having diversity in friendships. And that's, that's, you know, a, a, a very necessary part of, of growth, just human growth, you know, whatever. And so, but yeah. I, I think sometimes as individuals, we can do a little bit better, too. Like, if, if you feel like you're at a football game and, and, like, oh, that guy seems really cool. As a female, I would say, hey, what's your number? I'd love to get in yeah, touch with you. Yeah, but that's a little bit. That, that can <laughs> come across. I'm just as a female. I, I right. But, a female. but I'm just saying that can come across a little awkward. <laughs> Hey, can you give me my number? I want to get in touch with you. It's like, oh, I have everybody's phone number. Like, phone I know, but like, and, I mean, and it's this mom and and the girls, um, my girls' class. Oh gosh. Wait, hold on. Y'all be you giggling know. and stuff. Like, do you don't even know her last name? They're well because look, hey, we text each other. Let me get your phone number because sometimes I don't understand what the teacher's saying, and I need somebody to help clarify for me. Oh, sure, you know. And this one mom, she was just like send me voice messages on whatsapp or call me and we facetime me i'm just like she showed me like if you want to be a friend you have to if you want a friend you have to be that's, friendly but that's a woman thing like it don't work it doesn't work like that for me men can't just go and ask for each other for i mean yeah yeah i, don't, I mean i don't want to overly demonize that like you can but you it's can't just, corner somebody in and no that's like, weird bro like <laughs> bro why are you in my face man back up that now i want to fight you like you just have to be a friend yeah. and like like <laughs> Like, why are you hit my face like that, man? Stop texting me. Like, you know, <laughs> I will walk away and say that woman was so sweet. <laughs> right, but that you know what I mean. But that's like it's that. But it, that's the expectation for women, like men. Friend, it's just tough, man. And then like we have a, when we've been talking about this a lot on Mondays. We have we read this book and we talk about it or whatever. Like, there's a broken um, manhood is broken too. And so that affects our interactions with one another and the way that we and what we do and how we how our security in ourselves and stuff. And it's, so it, there's a lot. I, anyways, I'm saying I, I get what you're saying. It's, it's not a simple thing, but it's super, super necessary. Super necessary. So what about you? Oh. <laughs> Good transition. Yeah. Uh, 
I think, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't expecting you to say that. <laughs> oh, he's just, well, he's looking at me too. Look, he's not uh, ready now. No, I'm ready. Mm. I'm ready. Come on. Come on. Let me read the question. Come on. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, for me, I think it's self confidence uh, is a big thing that has, I mean, since day one, even till now, holds me back. I've made progress, um, but, you know, I, and I don't mean self confidence. Yeah, it literally means confidence in yourself, but it's a deeper issue for me because, like, I know that I'm not capable to do half of the stuff I'm doing, but, like, I don't have confidence that God is capable to do this stuff through me because I know that it's God that is calling this. I know that it's God that's plotting and planning this. I know that it's God who is ordering these steps. But equally, I'm like, oh, that stuff doesn't happen through people like me. Mm. And I don't say it directly like, oh, God is incapable of doing it through me, but that's what my actions show. And so there's a weird space of confidence that you can have confidence in Christ, which it looks like self-confidence to a lot of people. It's just because you know who he is and you know what he's told you to do or where he sent you or, you know, where he's led you, whatever, whatever you want to put it. doesn't matter. You know that and you operate in that. You operate in your space that he's sent you to or called you to or led you to. Um, but to, I think to other, pe- other people, it's like, oh, he's really confident. And you, it's, you are confident. But it's not confident in self, it's confident in Christ. So when we are in a space, for me, I'm saying we, like I'm, when I'm in a space that I know that I've been called to and led to, I, and I lack self-confidence, which I do today, like, you know, it, like it, it really reveals in me like that I don't have full confidence that God can do anything but use somebody like me. I mean, he can save me, but like to use me as a leader in this capacity or to be able to do this, like I can't, I can't do it. And it affects me in a lot of areas. Uh, fundraising is probably the biggest one. It's like, oh, no one wants to give me any money. They don't believe in you. Like, why would they give you money? Who are you? You don't know anybody. You know what I mean? Oh, they're going to think you're a crook. They're going to think you're this. They're going to think you're not trustworthy. You know, whatever. And, like, it just turns into this. But the problem is, is I'm focusing on me, right? Like, mm-hmm. they don't think you are. Like, I never say they don't think God's trustworthy. <laughs> they don't think God's, yeah. they think God's going to be a crook. Like, it's never that. So I'm focusing on me. And it's the same thing. That's my issue is I focus more on me than on God a lot of times. And so I guess that on the spiritual level, that's my biggest issue. Because preaching every Sunday, like, and there's a point where I think you should be nervous a little bit. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? You don't want to come in like, ah, you know, you want to say the right things. And it's, it's a, it is a serious responsibility. You know, you want to preach the right things and uh, give people what they need to grow in their faith, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, equally, like, I'm so, like, I lack so much confidence. When I get up there, you can't tell because I've, I've got, just gotten used to it. And so, like, I can, I can be oozy, <laughs> like, you know, my heart is pumping uh, lack of confidence. But then when I talk, it seems like, oh, he's pretty confident. And it's not true, you know. But, um, and I think that's, that's essentially held me back is not being able to rest in his sufficiency and him being able to do anything he wants through anybody, mm. even me. And so that's an area I've been working on really is trying to uh, just trying to grow in my it, and, fo- and focus on him and not focus on me. Because that's really, again, that's we, we paint it all these other ways, but that's really what it is, is you focus yeah. too much on yourself and your own. And it's the same thing as people who focus on their own ability. It's equally as damaging to focus on your own disability because your abilities or disabilities don't really matter to Jesus. That's not he doesn't care. Like, he's going to do what he's going to do. You know what I mean? And so, like, for me, that's, I think that's the biggest thing that's really um, affected me and held me back in every area. You know what I mean? Um, and leading the church and fundraising and stuff like that, even here, just in the office and stuff. And just, like, slowly stepping into that role of leadership and, like, accepting it. And it's not that anyone hates being a leader or loves being a leader. It has nothing to do with that. It's just like, I'm, I don't know if I'm capable and the answer to that is probably you're probably not, but it's not about you being capable. It's about, you know, it's about Jesus, like Jesus being enough to. And, and if God has called you to it, then he's a supplier, he's a provider and he provides your needs and your needs are what you need to accomplish God's will for your life. Your needs are not what you always think your needs are. Yeah. And so your needs are what he says you need, not what you think you need. And so if he sends me to lead the church, then he's supplied those needs. So what am I fretting for? You know, what am I, what am I upset? Well, and why am I even focusing on myself? It doesn't matter. Again, if it doesn't matter that I'm qualified or not, I don't know if what I'm saying is making sense, but. Yeah. Um. I think, I think part of it, I don't know, I could be wrong, is that, um, and I've heard you say it a lot, is that you understand the weight of the responsibility of being an elder at the church and of mm. pre- taking on the role of preaching. Um, and so when you know that 
you're going to be judged by it, you understand your your role in it, yeah. you know. And so I think it's fair to say that, you know, you feel a little bit nervous or in, insecure because you want to make sure you say the right thing, do the right thing because yeah, yeah. there is a cost. I mean, it's going to affect somebody. You yeah. Know? Hey, but, but you know, like I study a lot. I mean, I think you guys know that. Like, I, I mean, I spend a lot of time. <laughs> study it mm. like a lot probably too, yeah. honestly probably too much to an extent to where it affects like i have too much information coming sunday and whatever and i'm trying to like I, then i gotta filter it out and i'm more stressed because what do i cut out this is all so good and mm. you know whatever but equally like i study a lot because i'm trying to make up for my insufficiencies so that like what looks like an admirable quality is really me like uh it's really something that's that needs i need to be healed of or you know what i mean i need to give to jesus because and like studying is great. More pastors need to study. Believe me. Um, but equally, like, where do we don't find our identity in how much we study or how much yeah. we know? Mm-hmm. Yes, it's a great thing to do, but that doesn't define me who I am. And and that's a, there's a there's a very fine line in the middle of this, you know, somewhere. And so it's like finding that. And yes, study, continue to study hard and learn more. But the reason I study so much, which works in my favor to an extent, is because I feel so insufficient. I feel dumb. Like. I don't think like I don't think I'm this. I don't think I'm when in some of these issues. I feel dumb. I don't think I'm a stupid person. That's not what. But I don't think I'm the smartest person ever either. I just think I'm a very average, normal person of uh, a normal person of average intelligence. So I'm like, okay. But then I see other people with what I would consider the the same level of intellect as me. And so for me, I'm like, if I want to advance further, I need to work harder. And which there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, there's a lot of truth to that. But equally. I cannot allow my source of of success in the kingdom of God to be my work ethic. I have to let my work ethic be a response to the source that he is in my life. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so it's not nothing really needs to change on a practical level. It's just understanding the place of that. And it, it, it'll change my my ability to rest and relax and have confidence that he is enough. You know, and, and I can still study a lot. I can still do all these things, but it's just putting things, prioritizing or putting things in the right place. Because right now, I think subconsciously, I see how much work I put in as the source of a good message. And that's obviously mm. not. And so, but because he is the source and because of what he's, what he's done and what he showed me and because he is enough, that propels me, that should propel me to, to study and to have, but not in a nervous, like stressed out state. You know what I mean? Yeah. But in a more you know, uh, relaxed state and stuff. And so, and like, it, it, I'm not stressed out to the point, like it's, it's not, I say stressed out, but I probably shouldn't say that. Cause some people were like, you know what I mean? They really deal with like major stress, but like it gets to the point where like, I don't even like making decisions. When it's like, what do you want to eat? I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to decide anything else. Like I've made enough decisions for the day. Like, yeah, he'll max out on his decision making. That's, that, that's, <laughs> ex- that's extreme. Like, but I'm, I don't want to decide things that someone else can decide. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care. Feed me whatever. Like, you know, and if you're married, you it. know how much of an argument that is. What do you want to eat? I don't know. Whatever you want to eat. I don't know. What do you want to eat? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> like, no, I, what, I mean, yeah. So that's the thing for me is like, and the girl is like, can we go outside and play? I'm like, I don't know. Like, what do you think? Like, you know, I mean? like, like you know. And so, or like even after a certain time, like somebody, Carlos or somebody will come up like, what do you think about it? Like, I, I don't know, man. Like if it, if it's something important, like obviously I'll always like, if Joey's like, can I get a tattoo? No, that's an easy decision to make, you know, but on things that like really don't affect anybody, it's not going to hurt anyone or whatever. Like I just don't even, at that point, sometimes I just don't want, I don't even want to make more decisions. Like I just get worn out, but it's because it's not because I make so many decisions. It's because I, I depend so much on myself to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, okay, dude, just relax. And so that's why we kind of a part of the reason why we started a new thing too, mm-hmm. is we're taking this week and you guys know about it. I'm telling them we're taking this week to kind of as leadership uh, at the church and stuff. And there's basically the core members just taking time to like, just pray about direction and stuff for next year and just uh, really getting in a deeper habit of seeking God and like hearing from him and just being led by God and not by good ideas and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, Oh, it's a process. But yeah, that, that's definitely helped me back a lot. Um, I think from a practical stance, I think people could say that's what propelled me like to just progress in on any level, a small progression, big progression or anything, which there is some truth to that. But equally, like we know that God is infinitely more capable than us to do infinitely more than we can do. Mm-hmm. And, but in his way, in his and from his perspective. So 
let's say I, let's say that I, I have come a long way, but how much more longer would I a long? How much? Telling Jolie, <laughs> how much? How much more? How much further along? See, now she is affecting me. How much further along would I be doing it? like his way in every step of the way instead of like me having confidence in myself or wasting time lacking confidence in myself mm -hmm. which you know what i mean because again it's the same thing it's like a mirror image the guy in the mirror is raising his left hand you're raising your right hand like you know what i mean but it's because it's reflection it's the same thing you know and so so yeah that's my biggest that's my biggest struggle i think friendships that's a big thing like for this point at this point for me in my life I, like i'm good with my friendship that doesn't mean i couldn't use more but when I, you're 24, right? Yeah. So when I was like around your age, like that was a big deal for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I had a lot of friends because we just lived in a different context. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had a lot of close friends and stuff like that. And, um, but now living here, it's a little bit harder with where we live and stuff. But equally, like, it's just different. Man. I'm a different stage in my life, my wife and my kids. And like, and then you guys are, you're across the street. He's down the street. And Miguel's over there. And I'm older, too, so it's easier. for And we have kids, so it's easier for me to sit and talk to Miguel. As for you, it's like, how's it going? Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's 55. And so it's like, what do you, you know, he's 30 years older than you. And so it's like, but for, you know, for us, like, we our kids play together and stuff like, you know, mm -hmm. like that and whatever. And so, and we could talk about yard work. Because, you know, like, we just have we're just a different stage of our life. And so, but I think that would be a big one for me if I was your age and I moved here. Um. If I was in your situation, I think that would be a, a big one for me as well. So I get that. So, yeah, I think that's mine. It's just, um, yeah, just lack of self-confidence and lack, and lack of who, not of who I am capable of being on my own, but who God is capable of making me into, you know what I mean? Or who he's made me into even in some state, you know, some points. And that's a ongoing struggle that I have. But I think a lot of people have that. And I don't say that to excuse it, but I say that to like we need to get past this and really maximize our, our potential for the glory of God, you know? I think um, the confidence thing is, um, it's not tricky, but it can be difficult because no one wants to be the overly confident guy, hmm. you know? It's yeah, just a put too. off. And so we say in order to avoid being that, we're going to go the opposite because it's, you can hide you can hide insecurity by saying, oh, it's humility, you know, and it's just, it's, which is false humility. It's false. Right. <laughs> and it's all, it's both wrong, you know, mm -hmm. um, lack of confidence in what God is, who God is and what he can do in, in you. you through you and overconfidence, not in who God is, but overconfidence in what he wants to do through you. Sometimes you don't play that major role that you think you do mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. grand scheme of things. Yeah. And, um, so finding that, that healthy balance is, Jesus is the balance. You know what I mean? I mean, he really is. Like, Jesus is the balance. He balances the scales. And from getting too high or too low, he just keeps you stable mm -hmm. through, you know, everything. The storms and the mountains and the seas and the sunlight, the sunshine. And so we don't talk about that part of it. Like, when things are good as well, he keeps you stable, not yeah. too high on yourself. And when the storms but, are here, not too but low. But do you think that it is, like, we are created to constantly be feeling like shifting Tension. yeah like that we yeah. should always be aware that we're not overly and always be aware but i don't think we're that. created to be like that i think we're created to be all sufficient I like mean, in, in, in perfect him, design but, yeah but. yeah but like i mean because the fall man like we just deal with this we deal like we're constantly what it is is we're constantly dealing with idolatry is we're trying to work always any sin that you that you commit is you trying to replace god with something and typically it's us that we're trying to replace God with. We're trying to take his place. That's what that's what Eve, like, you'll know what God knows and you'll be just like, that's what, like, that was the issue. And that's the issue now is, like, any time that we're, like, we fall with something, we're so in some way, shape, or form, we're replacing, like, we're trying to replace God with ourselves and we're putting us ourselves in his position. And it comes from a lack of trust in him. And, like, I mean, if someone looks at pornography and that's an addiction, it's they're replacing something that, like God is sufficient in his provision for sexuality. And so you're trying to replace that on your own because you feel sufficient or insufficient for some reason. And you know what I mean? And so like you turn into this own, like, and it goes to everything, man. If you're stealing, I mean, that's an obvious one. You know what I mean? And so it's constantly, you're trying to put yourself in God's place in your life. And so that there is a constant tension of that. And, and Jesus is the, to keep you, He's paid the price to keep you on the right side of that, you know what I mean, of that tension. And you're definitely going to feel the temptation of it being constantly pulled back. But he's the solution to that. Because I think 
even before in the Old Testament, you see people going way right, way left, way right, way left, you know, and you see like, you know, these uh, sinful generation of these people, whatever, and they're way here. But then you see the Pharisees and stuff who are like, OK, they go way left. But if you go left far enough, it takes you all the way around back to far right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's like it's like politics. <laughs> but it like, you know, it takes you back to sinfulness in your quote unquote righteousness and holiness. And Jesus comes to be the balance of that tension. You know what I mean? Of, he kind of sits you right in the middle. And like we were talking about, he doesn't, that's why he doesn't fit into these groups. It's because any group without Jesus is extreme. And so it's like he comes to kind of create a new category, a new community in him. And you kind of live with other blessed points of community. Like, you know, he's looking for more community to kind of keep you because together we can live in this tension and we can kind of when he's pulled that way or I'm pulled that way, we can kind of pull one another back or when then I start going this way, we can kind of pull me back. You know what I mean? And it kind of keeps us in that constant tension. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, I, I think the fact that we feel that tension is it. We're in, that means we're in the middle. It's a good place. When we stop feeling the tension, then, uh, you know, I think we're probably all to one side. And <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like, you know. Because like we were saying, confidence is good, but confidence in who? But humility is good, but humility based on what? Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? So you can do both in Jesus. It's not confident or humility. It's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm humble. Oh, yeah, that's the word. I couldn't think of the word. Like, I'm humble, but I'm confident in who he is. You know, I'm, I'm humble in the sense that I know that I'm insufficient, but I'm equally confident that it, my insufficiency doesn't matter because he's more than sufficient, more than enough. Mm-hmm. And so that's the tension that Jesus is for us, you know. So. All right. You guys are the great, greatest at shutting us down. We always go, go, always go right um, like to an hour and 10 minutes or less right there. So we're finishing up. So, yeah. All right. So you don't got nothing else? No, no. You don't got nothing else? Nope. All right. So, listener, thank you for listening. That's what listeners do. <laughs> now, we really appreciate you guys. Um. Uh, you're loving your support. Always listening to us babble on for a while, whether about politics. We appreciate your interest in really what's going on in Bolivia and things like that. Um, yeah. Until next time, we will. <laughs> it's always weird to close the deck because you don't know have to say. Have so, a good week. Yeah. Have a good week. Until next time. I know Ciao. you're going to try to do it. Provecho. <laughs> <laughs>